Okay, welcome to uh, Ibn Live in the Caves. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your, uh, your wisdom. And uh, it's all yours. Take it away. Uh, this is not about wisdom. This is about the lack of wisdom. Um, I know Shun uh, soon shared the story. Uh, these are some pictures of the things we'll be talking about. Um, and let's get started. Thank you, of course, Mayor and Leave Note for allowing this, uh, allowing this to happen. Uh, so let's go way back to 1982. And I was living and farming in the Galilee, just a few kilometers from Tsipori, that we talked about last week. It was Shabbat, and a group of us were sitting in the afternoon and studying ancient texts that dealt with our immediate surroundings. The following Midrash from the Talmud was read aloud, and I'd never heard of it before. The Roman Emperor Antoninus had a certain underground cave from which there was a tunnel that went from his house to the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Every day he would bring two servants to serve him. He would kill one at the entrance of the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and would kill the other one at the entrance of his house so that no living person would know that he had visited Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was the head of the Jewish community in the land of Israel at the time. This seemed to be yet another one of those fantastic, hard to believe midrashim that can be found in the Talmud. Midrashim can sometimes be understood literally and be true stories, and sometimes they are to be understood as parables or fantastic stories, but with a lesson for us all. Then we read something from a book compiled by Ze'ev Vilna'i that was even more fascinating. It was a quote from a famous rabbi from Tzfat who lived in the golden age of the 16th century. And today, there is a synagogue named for him that is not far from Livnot. His name was Rabbi Moshe Alshech, a great scholar, and gave great sermons. And he wrote a book called Lily of the Valleys, Shoshanat Amakim. Here you can see in the middle the synagogue that is named for Al Sheikh, not far from Livnot, on the left in the great Sfat Cemetery, uh, Rabbi Al Sheikh's grave, he's known as the Holy Al Sheikh, and on the right, uh, an early copy of his book. In this book, we read the following Antonino Caesar would go to learn with Rabbi Yehuda Nasi every single day and night by way of the secret cave. And is it even possible to imagine that there was a secret cave from the big city of Rome all the way to Tsipori, and that it would take months to walk there, and the sea is between them? But here we see with our own eyes today, today is the 16th century, that very close to Tsipori is a place called Roma, and that is where Antonino sat and he changed its name to Roma, like his own city. And about this cave it is said that the Mashiach will come from an entrance to Rome. My first reaction after hearing this was to blurt out, hey, let's just go to Roma and look for the cave. And everybody around me just broke into laughter. I was so embarrassed. But it was, I have to admit, somewhat absurd. When the study session was over, one young man named Nehemiah came over to me. It seemed out of sympathy more than anything else. And he said, look, I heard what you said. And if you really want to go to Roma, I'll go with you and we'll go exploring. I was really happy to hear this. Later, we agreed to meet after work on Sunday and go hike over to the place known as Chirbet Roma, the ruins of Ruma, and you can see it's right in the middle of the Lower Galilee, in between the two seas, 
a little bit north of Tsipori. And in between Ruma and Tsipori, an ancient main road and a main road still today. Mikhail? Yes. Uh, if you're sharing, I can't see it. Okay. Like if you're sharing a map or something, it's not on the screen. Okay, I understand. So now I get you. Okay. There it is. Thank you for letting me know. And sorry that you had to watch me the whole time. But uh, <laughs> here are the things I was talking about. And this is, uh, this is the gravesite in the synagogue in the book by Rabbi Alshech. And here we are at the map. Here's Ruma, and here's Tsipori, who we talked about right in the middle of the gallery. So at 4 p.m. the next day, we grabbed some canteens, hats, and some candles and matches, and headed out to hike the few kilometers to Ruma. Why candles? I don't remember. It was a long time ago. Perhaps the idea of exploring was more a motivating factor for us than actually finding something. Um, so I just remember being so excited to be exploring something so mysterious and so ancient. So I guess the logistics didn't play a big role here. We began hiking in high spirits and soon we were in a Bedouin town in a valley known as Bikat Betrimon, or in English that would be the Valley of the House of the Pomegranates. And Zev in his book said that this was a place that for generations had grown the biggest and best pomegranates in all of Israel. The village's name was, and still is, Rumat Heb, you can see it here, and was adjacent to the ancient Tel of Ruma, and so named, Rumat Heb. People here were incredibly nice. We passed the mosque, and everybody greeted us with a wave and a blessing, and it turns out that most of the men serve in the IDF. As the name of the village hints, the Bedouins here were from the El Heb tribe, Rumat Heb. And that tribe, the El Heb tribe, had made a bond with the Jewish state even before there, there was a Jewish state, serving proudly even in the Palmach before 1948. We were offered some coffee even though we were on a mission. We thought it would be rude to say no. And this happened a number of times and soon we needed a bathroom. Uh, and because of all this, by the time we reached Ruma, and this is an aerial photo by somebody flying over, just, it was just as the sun was setting and the place was full of caves, scores of them. In fact, there were so many caves that we decided to split up and go cave searching on different sides of the ancient hill before dark. We were searching, of course, for tunnels. In one cave, I found an ancient burial tomb. In another, I found a garbage dump. And in one cave I found, in this cave, I found the following, a tunnel. Uh, wait, I thought, this is what we're here for, a tunnel. I looked at it with the faint light of my candle and it looked incredibly small for a normal sized human. Yet this is what we were looking for. So I went outside, of course, and called for Nehemiah, who came immediately, and we entered the cave together. We couldn't believe our eyes. We came here on a silly whim to find a tunnel mentioned in the Talmud, and we'd actually found a tunnel. It was amazing, but there was just one problem. Who would go in first? We certainly aren't gonna leave without going inside and seeing where this tunnel would take us, maybe even towards Sipori. But I told Nehemiah, I want you to go in first. Nehemiah took a good look at the tunnel entrance and said, uh, look, uh, Michael, you, you found it first, so you go in first. I told him while actually nudging him forward that that simply was not gonna happen, but that I'd be right behind him the entire way and would make sure not to burn his backside with my candle. Hesitantly, Nehemiah got on his belly and started to crawl. 
and I was right after him. After a few seconds, he asked me, straight or right, which way should I turn? Since I didn't want him to stop leading, I blurted out as if I knew exactly where he should turn. Uh, go straight. And then left or right? Right. After a few minutes, we got to a round room with plenty of space and several different tunnel exits, almost identical. We stopped for a moment, both of us breathing heavily. This is amazing. It's like an underground city. Are we in a dream or is this really happening? And then our candles went out. No problem. I took the box of matches out of my pocket and relit them. But soon they went out too, and soon there were no matches. And this is what we saw. Total, absolute darkness. Oh, no. And then something happened to me that I had no control over. I started breathing heavily, very quickly. And I felt myself going out of control. And I was having my first ever panic attack. I felt like we were definitely going to die. There's simply no way we could ever find our way out of this maze. I don't even remember what directions I told Nehemi to crawl in. I even started crying silently and blessed the darkness so that Nehemi would not notice. But he knew. And he was very calm. Well, I don't think we'll have a problem getting back, he said. Let's lick our palms and we'll be out of here in no time. And I thought to myself, Nehemiah might be acting calm, but he's in worse condition than I am. Lick our palms, are, are you insane? No, no, listen, I remember, he says, I remember learning in physics class about air pressure and wind currents. Now, we don't know which tunnel will lead us back, so here in the darkness, we'll lick our palms and feel for the wind coming in. Whichever tunnel provides us with wind, that will be our exit. Now, I thought he was making this all up as he went along, but it sounded like a fine enough plan for me. I certainly had no suggestions other than breathing quickly. And it worked. Within a few minutes, we were back in the entrance room. We scampered out of the cave, and I hugged Nehemia in appreciation for simply saving my life. And I wondered, had we found the tunnel that led to Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's house in Sipori? And I thought, never have less qualified people discovered something so amazing. But from this, I learned an important lesson. To discover things, you don't need to be qualified. You don't need a degree. It helps to act intelligently. But what you lack in qualification, you can often make up with spirit, with inspiration. And therefore, I heartily encourage everybody to do their own exploring in the land of Israel or in life. We went back to our village in total darkness, but we were dancing on air. We couldn't wait to go back and explore our cave again. But this time, now we were really using our intelligence. We'd bring lots of candles and string. So we went straight to Dahlia, the resident expert on all things historical and natural, who had been a guide in a field school and we reported to her our discovery. After interrogating us about every detail, she said, I can't believe it, here in the Galilee? We have to report this to the ICRC, the Israel Cave Research Center. But first I wanna see it myself. What are you guys doing tomorrow after work? The next day, we were already a group of almost 10 people hiking over to Ruma, but this time we came so much better prepared we had a big ball of string and two entire boxes of Shabbat candles and matches. I know it's outright embarrassing. This time, Nehemiah led the way again with Dahlia behind him, and I was the last person in line. My job was to tie the string to a stone, and when we had to turn back, I would simply be the first in line and lead everybody back following the string. This time, we got farther into the cave, and then suddenly, after a while, the woman who was crawling in front of me started breathing really fast and panicking and told me and then screamed to me at the top of her lungs, get me out of here now. So I announced that we're heading back and I turned around to lead the group with the hysterical woman now very close behind me. As I began crawling, according to the string, I saw a rock in front of me. 
yes, I had pulled the anchor rock with me the entire way without noticing it. The woman behind me saw the stone too, and she realized that I had no idea how to crawl out of this cave, and she began crying. Wow, I thought, that was me just yesterday. But now I was calm. In order to calm her, I said to her, no need to worry. I'll get us out of here in no time. Just lick our palms. But before I could explain what I meant, she screamed, lick our palms? Is that your solution to getting us totally lost out of these caves? Lick our palms? Are you insane? But lo and behold, in a few minutes, we were back in the entrance cave. As we made our way back to our own village, Dahlia told Nehemiah and myself that while this was an amazing discovery, caving is not something for amateurs. She would get us in touch with the ICRC cave folks, and they would know what to do. At first, they didn't believe us, but Dahlia convinced them that this was a bona fide discovery. I didn't understand why they thought we would make this up. Who could really make this up? Within a week, a team arrived, and they had... They were serious, with some serious equipment. We took them to the cave, and we asked to stay there and be with them while they explored and took notes and photographs and mapped it out. This is the map they made of the cave system in Ruma. Their first reaction was very surprising to us. They were literally in a state of awe. I heard them say to each other, can you believe this? In the Galilee. And I noticed that these people actually felt at home in caves. These were professionals who were at the same time both careful and yet adventurous. And as we crawled through, they explained things to us. These were hiding caves for Jews thousands of years ago. You see this room with the hole in the floor at the edge? And you see that rock here? That, hand that rock to me. I gave him the rock. It fit perfectly over the hole. This way, if the Romans came in to hunt down the Jews, an entire family could go down into this hole. Well, someone who stayed outside could cover it up with the rock and put dirt on top of it. And the Romans, scampering through to find Jews, would have no idea that underneath them was another cave. Now, the family wouldn't have a lot of air, but it would hopefully be enough for the enemy to come to the room and keep on going until they left the cave. These guys understood caves, and I so wanted to be like them. When we came out of the cave, the leader said, listen, I don't know if you know what you found, but... This is a secret hiding cave complex, apparently from the time of the Barcoca Revolt, and it's the first ever to be found in the Galilee. Until now, all the complexes have been found way south of here. This is a great discovery, and this will have an effect on how researchers and historians will view the entire revolt. And I turned to Nehemia and whispered to him, Who is Barcoca? I went to the team leader, and while they were packing up their gear, I asked him to tell me a little about the Bar Kocha revolt. And while he was at it, could he tell me how I could possibly, maybe, join the team? He said, well, if you work on a few things, we can talk about it. And perhaps in the future, you can be our northern rep. Now I was getting excited. I asked him what I have to work on. He said, first of all, uh, buy a headlamp. Uh, <laughs> um, first of all, buy a headlamp. The law prohibits using candles in caves and it can cause numerous problems. Second of all, you have to spend a lot of time in caves and you have to make sure you actually enjoy being in caves. Third, you have to learn how to repel. And lastly, you have to learn a little bit more about the history of the land of Israel. Knowing about the Bar Kocha revolt, is a must. That was a tall order. There's so much out there about history of the land of Israel in general and the Bar Kocha revolt in specific, but now I had a path to follow. I'd enjoyed farming, but at the moment, I felt that I wanted to make caving a big part of my life, and it kind of overtook me. I returned to Ruma on my own. That's me back then. And with others, also, at times, and I got to feel at home there. I also felt something else, and this, perhaps, is the most important part. I felt a real, visceral connection to my ancestors. If the Talmudic sources, indeed, were about this Betrimon Valley, 
that I was sitting in the same spot that others sat in terror and even survived this terrible traumatic revolt. A few weeks later, since this was 1982, the first war in Lebanon broke out and my unit was sent into southern Lebanon. It was only the second time I'd been in the reserves and I didn't know very many people there. But being together in such situations helps you make friends easily. On the second day of the war, we were going through a non-inhabited area of bushes and boulders, and it was time for a rest stop. I went over to a hill, and I found a cave. It looked just like a burial cave I had seen in Ruma, and but there were no tunnels. So I took a few pictures, the old kind. After a few days, it was Shabbat, and the battalion camped out in some abandoned houses. As Shabbat began, I saw some of the older religious soldiers put on white dress shirts in honor of Shabbat. And I thought to myself, what? They brought white shirts with them to the war? But these were veteran soldiers who had been around the block a few times, and they knew exactly what to bring. We had a beautiful Kabbalat Shabbat and a festive Shabbat evening meal. And afterwards, there was an announcement. There will be an optional lecture for those interested in the history of the Jewish community in Lebanon. I thought to myself, what? They brought a lecture to a war? But Actually, it just so happens that one of the soldiers was a professor of history at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv. I went to the lecture, there were a lot of people there, and it was fascinating. Afterwards, I went up to the man and thanked him, and I said, you know, just a few days ago, we stopped to rest, and I saw what looked like a, a burial cave, the kind we have in Israel. And he said, really? When you develop those pictures, please send me the copies. I'm very interested in caves. I said, well, if we're already on the subject of caves, just a few weeks ago, some Bar Kokhva revolt era tunnels were discovered in the lower Galilee. He said, uh, no, that's not possible. There aren't any tunnels like that in the Galilee. I said, well, now there are. He said, look, you, you must take me there as soon as this war is over. Something only an Israeli would say. I said, no problem, but listen, I, I, I want to learn about Jewish history in general and the Bar Kokhva revolt in particular. I'm a farmer right now, but I, I can take like a day off a week and, and study. You think you could help me? And he said, you know what? Let's make a deal. You show me those caves so that I can take pictures from my research, and I'll set you up to audit classes about history in general and the revolt in particular, including one of my own that I give every semester. We shook on it. We both survived the war, and in the fall of 1982, we kept our promises. So let's retrace our steps and talk about the history of Ruma. Ruma is first mentioned in Jewish literature in the Bible. Yes, in the Book of Kings, when a Jewish king ascended the throne, it often mentions his mother's name and sometimes her hometown. I know that sounds like the beginning of a joke about Jewish mothers, but I'm not going to go there right now. Anyway, when mentioning King Yehoiakim, it says, and his mother's name was Zvuda Bat Pdaya from Ruma. Now, it's possible that it could be another Ruma somewhere else in Israel, but according to the context of Yehoiakim and other kings, it actually does make sense that this would be our Ruma in the Lower Galilee. Hundreds of years later, already in the Roman period, in nearby Yodfat, there was a famous big battle against the Romans in the Great Revolt, the first revolt against the Romans, in the year 66 of the Common Era. But our only real source of the play-to-play -play battle is historian Josephus Flavius, who writes, and afterwards, some amazing acts of bravery were done by two brothers, Natura and Philippus, of Ruma village, also born in the Galilee. So we can see that already in the first century of the Common Era, citizens of Ruma had a tradition of bravery in battle. Now we come to the Bar Kokhva revolt. And some say it's between 132 and 135, 136, it doesn't really matter, but that the beginning of the second century. What we know about this revolt has had to be pieced together over years from three main sources. Stories from the Talmud, a Roman historian who wrote a few lines about the revolt, and archeological finds. One scholar of this revolt said that both the Romans and the Jews suffered such terrible casualties from this three-year war, and neither 
wanted to record it in detail. But most historians agree that the revolt began because of two reasons. <clears throat> the Roman Emperor Hadrian's edict to turn Jerusalem into a pagan city with a pagan temple, and his edict to forbid circumcision under the penalty of death. Afterwards, this snowballed into 19 different edicts that he enacted, including the penalty of death for the following, studying the Torah in public, lighting Shabbat candles, ordaining rabbis, eating matzah and having a Passover Seder, blowing the shofar, and more. Tens of thousands of soldiers were killed. Almost all the Jewish community leaders were executed, and hundreds of thousands of innocent Jews died thanks to Roman cruelty. But the question to be asked is also, what would have happened to the Jewish people if we had not revolted? Would there still be Judaism today? But in any case, the Valley of Betrimon, the Valley of the House of the Pomegranate, is mentioned in the Talmud when discussing this revolt. And because of its extreme cruelty, Hadrian Caesar is mentioned here with his Talmudic nickname, Hadrian, may his bones be crushed. Only two others shared this nickname. Both were very cruel Roman leaders. And this is the story. Hadrian, may his bones be crushed, set up three roadblocks. And they said, if someone escapes from here, they'll be caught there, and vice versa. Many Jews gathered in the Bet Rimon Valley. Hadrian said to his chief of staff, by the time I finish this piece of bread and this leg of chicken, I want them all to be dead. Immediately, they were all surrounded by his legions and killed, and the blood was deep and ran all the way to the Kiprus River. Now, although some researchers place this valley way south of the Galilee, its context hints that it was right here near Tsipori. And finally, one of the most morbid sources ever written about the Bar Kokhba revolt, and I apologize if this is too morbid for some, comes from another story in the Talmud, and it refers to the final stages of the revolt. When things were at their worst, there was no food, people were hunted, and they resorted to cannibalism of the dead. And this is what is written in the Talmud. In the Bet Rimon Valley, those that survived hid in caves and came out only at night according to the smell of their dead, and they brought of them and ate. Every day another person would take their turn and bring. Once, one person went out and found his father dead. He immediately buried him and put a sign on his grave. He came back and he said, I have found nothing. And they said, another person will go out instead. Another person went out and went according to the smell of the same dead person and found him and brought of him. As they were eating, they asked the person who had just come back, from where did you bring this? And he answered, from such and such a place. And the man who went out first asked him, what sign did you see above the ground? And he answered, there was such and such a sign. And the man who went out first said, woe is he who has eaten from the flesh of his own father. This is the most nightmare story I know from the Barcoke Revolt. But as painful as it is to hear, it reflects to us how terrible things were for the Jewish population at the time. There are two more generic stories in the Talmud that are not from the Galilee, but are important in giving us an idea of what it was like to hide in caves from the Romans during the revolt. Shmuel said, people were hiding in a cave, and they said, the enterer can enter, but the leaver cannot leave. One's sandal flipped, and they thought that someone left and the enemy saw him, and now they're coming upon them. They trampled each other and killed each other more than the enemy would have killed them. Rabbi Eli ben Elazar says they were sitting in a cave and they heard noise of a nail studded sandal above the cave. They thought the enemy was coming upon them and they trampled each other and killed each other more than the enemy would have killed them. In order to understand the above two terrible stories, Here's a short explanation. At a certain stage during the revolt, Roman soldiers would swoop in and kill or capture any Jews they found. It was usually killing. There were lookouts of the Jews to warn the people 
if the Romans would be about to storm the town. But some people might not make it back to their homes or hiding places in time. If so, they would not enter a hiding place since the advancing Roman soldiers would see them and know where people were hiding. So those who were already hiding in the cave could basically trust a Jewish person entering the cave that they would do so only if they were sure that they weren't seen. However, no matter how claustrophobic or panic-stricken the people hiding in the cave would be, they would never be allowed to just leave without an all-clear sign, because at that very moment, there might be Romans who would see them, and then they'd come in and call all the rest who were hiding there. Therefore, they said, the enterer can enter, but the lever cannot leave, which means that they had guards in the cave to check those coming in and prevent those from escaping. And indeed, very many hiding complexes around Israel have a small guard room at the entrance. In the second story, we should know that the Romans were really the only ones who had nail-studded sandals, like you see here, like today's cleats for better traction. And this sandal boot, known as caliga, was standard Roman military gear, and remains of it has been found at Masada and other places too. So one way that the hiders in the limestone caves could know that there are Romans right on top of them is from the sound of those nails on the rocks above. And they would know that at this very moment, every sound they make might give away their location and lead to their mass deaths. But the tension and the pressure could definitely lead some people into panic attacks, which are sometimes contagious. And I knew about panic attacks firsthand already. The stories from the Talmud, for many, are reminiscent of stories from the Holocaust. People hiding silently, fearing for their lives, the stronger enemy hunting them down, listening for any screams or noise that might give away their location. According to the Roman historian who mentions the Bar Kochar Wolf, the Romans at first tried to enter the tunnel systems after finding them. But since they were never successful, because in these tunnels the advantage was always in favor of the defenders, they stopped going in and instead laid siege. The Talmud rounds out this story by relaying the testimony given by one survivor. They smoked the cave upon us. It turns out that the Romans, when finding the entrance to a tunnel system, would simply light a fire and send the smoke inside with billows to suffocate all the hiders. In the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, fighters and survivors hid in underground bunkers, and when the Nazis came hunting for them with their sensitive listening devices and detected any sounds, they would pump smoke and Zyklon B gas and explosives into the bunkers to kill those hiding. And this is how those in the command bunker at Mila 18 met their deaths. Those who came out because they couldn't breathe were obviously shot immediately. History, we see, often repeats itself. But this connection teaches us a lot about the very miracle of our survival. Let's go back to the story about Antonino Caesar and Rabbi Yudan Asi. This is a picture of all the uh, emperors of the empire. And you can see I put two red frames, one around Hadrian over here on the right, and down below the man from the Antoninus family, whose name was Caracalla, according to most researchers, who lived at the time of Rabbi Yudan Asi, and according to our tradition, had very good relations uh, there were between the two leaders. So a few years after the Bar Kokhba revolt, Hadrian died. You can see 138, two years approximately after the revolt. And another dynasty took over, a family much more tolerant than Hadrian. And according to the Talmud, there were excellent relations between the Caesar and the Jewish leader. And this is around the year 200 of the Common Era, the beginning of the third century. However, in the beginning of this reconciliation, it apparently wasn't in the emperor's best interest, certainly not for PR, to be seen with the Jewish leader. So researchers of the story that I mentioned in the beginning believe that the creators of this Midrash used tunnel imagery from an early period, the Bar Kokhba revolt in the second century, in a story from a later period, the emperor and the rabbi in the third century. And this happens often in Midrashic literature. It is literally timeless. 
For instance, there's a midrash about Moses as a baby, Moshe. Jewish mothers in Egypt had to hide their male babies, since Egyptians would murder them by throwing them into the Nile. And according to the midrash, the Jews would dig out tunnels and hide with their babies inside. The Egyptians, who knew that they were somewhere in the area, would come around with their own babies and pinch them to make them cry, which would cause the Jewish babies to cry, which would in turn let the Egyptians know where they were hiding. Since there is no source from the time of the Egyptians about this, many scholars believe that this was a midrash written in the wake of the Bar Kokhva revolt, since this would be a ploy perhaps that the Romans used too. But it was fitted onto a story for more than a thousand years earlier. Now, to complicate the story a little more, when the Talmud mentions Ruma, it is often spelled in Hebrew like this, Resh Vav Mem Aleph. But ancient texts don't include vowels, and vowels can change the meaning of a word. If the vowel dot were to be on the top, like you see here on the right, then the word would be read Ruma, uh, Roma, which is Rome. But if the vowel dot would be on the side, like you can see on the left, the word would be read Ruma, which is our site. This was the cause of a lot of misunderstanding, as we hear in some Jewish sources. And part of this was because many of the temple treasures were taken along with Jewish slaves to Rome. So there was a tradition that when the Mashiach would come, the temple treasures would be returned to Jerusalem, which means that for some, the Mashiach would have to show up first in Rome. And I quote from a Midrash, he asked him, where will the Mashiach appear? And he told them, at an entrance in Rome. This is what was quoted by the al -Sheikh. Some understood entrance to be a cave entrance. Now in the 14th century, 200 years before the great holy al -Sheikh, there was an anonymous Jewish traveler who came through the lower galley, and he wrote the following. From Tsipori, we walk to Romi. The tradition is that from here the Mashiach will arrive. And I have shown from a number of sources that this is Roma, mentioned in the Talmud. And this is where Antoninus Caesar lived. And it seems to me that perhaps this is how the great Alshech in the 16th century came to mention both Rome, Roma and Ruma in the same source. And just to show that certain mix-ups never die, this is the sign put up by the Nature and Parks Authority at Ruma. On the right is the Hebrew word Ruma, but on the left it was translated into English as Roma. Well, it's okay. Worse mistakes could have been made. Back to my own story just to close it up. Dahlia told me that I should go study and work at the same field school she was at years back, and I followed her advice. I'd fall in love with caving. And now that I was closer to the ICRC, I was able to get together my own team of Bar Kokhba Revolt era secret tunnel complex explorers. That's a long name, but it was very interesting. Together we found many such complexes all over central Israel, especially in the Gush Etzion area. The experiences we had during these adventures and discoveries could literally fill a book. When I came to work at Leave Note, I wanted to let Hevra feel what I had felt in those caves. You can study about the Bar Kokhba revolt by reading books, taking courses, listening to lectures, reading the sources, but you can feel the Bar Kokhba revolt by visiting caves like this. You might say that one visit to these caves is worth a thousand classes, and there are many guides, including those with us here today, who know this from personal experience. I've been with these note groups countless times in the Ruma caves, and I'm always very moved to be there. Every single time it hits me right in the gut. But I see over the years that this is also one of the most powerful, jolting, and emotional experiences for young Jews visiting Israel too. Actually, any people of any age. It's like a teleport. It can transport you back thousands of years. And it's become a leave no tradition. And according to some scholars, threatened Jews held circumcision ceremonies, weddings, and even Passover satyrs in caves like this. That connects. But there's one story that seems to hit home more than others. It concerns two pregnant mothers who were hiding in a secret tunnel system as the Romans were on their way 
to hunt them all down. As it was dark and there was a feeling of deathly panic in the caves, the two women went into labor at the same time and the ensuing balagan of chaos, the two babies got mixed up and the mothers could not figure out which baby belonged to which mother. I've never had a baby before, but I'm told that it's not a walk in the park and it's often quite a noisy endeavor for all involved. The strength of these women, these women who gave birth in total silence, even to give birth at all in these crazy times, to ensure the survival and continuity of the Jewish people, it binds you to them. These are the stories of our people. Together with similar stories from the Holocaust, we're able to connect the dots from our ancestors to today in a very powerful way. Now, there's usually two main reactions to a visit in these tunnels. One is, can we please get out of here now? And the other is, can we please stay a little bit longer? But most everybody agrees that after being in these caves with a group, turning off flashlights, trying to sit in perfect silence, trying to get into the mindset of hiding for your very life and that of your family and your community, one not only understands what their ancestors went through, but one also is able to appreciate how easy it is to be Jewish today with all the obstacles that this entails, even in 2020. It sticks with you. It gets inside of you. As it says, or you could say, as our ancestors did in this very cave, the enter may enter, but the lever may not leave. Tudor Abba.